You're listening to the Fresh Hell Podcast. Fresh Hell contains stories of a disturbing and often graphic nature and is intended for a mature audience. Please don't let your kids listen to this or they might turn out like us. Hi, I'm Annie from Boston. And I'm Johanna from Austria, and you are listening to Fresh Hell, your favorite international podcast. That's right. Thank you so much for tuning in to us for another episode. Tuning in, it's still, I I have to stop saying that. We're not a radio show. (laughs) But yeah, thank you for your ongoing support. And a special shout out, of course, to our newest Patreon members. And they are Ella Hill. Thanks, Ella. And Sally Poltney. Thanks so much, everyone. We really so grateful. Thank you, yes. And I also want to say a huge thank you to Astin for the most amazing Andy Warhol card and the present that came with it, even though you basically glitter bombed my mom's kitchen. But it's fine, it's fine, <laughs> it was totally worth it. And thank you, Cherise, for the absolutely lovely gift. I don't want to mention what it was because Annie's it's still on the way to her, but we will definitely show you in a video. Yeah, I'm super curious to see what it is because <laughs> I got this. You're all gonna cap. love it. We got the most amazing gift. <laughs> Best listeners. Okay, I think it's time to talk about the second half of the Sylvia Likens case. If you didn't listen to last week's episode, which of course is the first part, please pause now and go back to listen to that one first, just so you can follow everything from the beginning. And before we start, there's something we really want to talk about. This case, we mentioned it several times last week, is a horrible one. We told you already in the beginning of last week's episode, it's hard to read about it, it's hard to hear about it, and it's really hard to talk about it. And we always strive to treat every case with respect and care. In my opinion, and I think Annie agrees, this is one of those cases where the line between giving you all the the details and all the information and being almost exploitative is very thin. Now you could rightfully ask, why are you even covering this crime? And of course, Annie and I had discussed this as well, and Annie said something that I think is very true. She said it's important to talk about these things so that people become more aware. Yeah. I think you're right, Annie. Just being aware doesn't quite cut it, right? It's also important to know what you can do. In this case, for example, what are the signs of domestic violence or abuse? So we really want to take a few minutes now to let you know what to look for. And of course, we we could put this at the end of our episode. But we also think it's important that as many people as possible should hear it or can hear it. And that's why we decided to talk about it now. And if you think you already know all you need to know on this topic, you might want to skip a few minutes. I don't know, three, four, five, maybe. Of course, we could be super professionals and record this and time it and then go back and tell you exactly how much you can skip. But who has time for this? No. Yeah, not us. (laughs) Not us. Well, we would have the time. It's not so much time. It's more we don't have that kind of organizational skills. <laughs> That's true. We, um, yeah. So we've all heard cases, right, where people were in some form of danger or distress, but they just they couldn't tell you for various reasons. And so what are some of the possible signs that someone might be in a bad situation like domestic violence and they might need your help? This is in no way a complete list. We are not experts. And there are so many forms of domestic violence or just general abusive behavior, you know. And of course, it's easier to spot these signs if you know the victim at least a little bit. Some of the things that you want to keep an eye on are people who make excuses for injuries that you suspect don't make sense, right? Personality changes. So if they suddenly seem more withdrawn, don't spend more time with you. If somebody has low self-esteem suddenly, who was always really confident, if they suddenly become anxious or surprisingly aggressive, just, just a, you know, real personality change, a noticeable one. One that we see all the time, although I don't really necessarily agree with this one, is that they say, you know, constantly checking in with their partner. I mean, it depends on the reason why you're checking in with my partner. Like, we are both checking in with our partners a lot, but it's not because they demand it. And I think that makes a difference. No, that's right. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah, I once had a friend, we were going somewhere and I said, oh, I'm just texting Paul to let him know that we're heading out. They were like, does he make you text when you're leaving? And I was like, no, 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 no. I just want to make sure someone knows what my trail is if I go missing. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) He'll know that at this time I left for here with so-and-so or, you know, that kind of thing. Same with the next one, never, you know, never having any money on hand. I never have any money on hand, but I have credit cards. That's the difference is, is, do you know someone who 
you'd have to know that they're financially okay, but they never have mm. the ability to pay for anything. That can be a sign, if that makes sense. You know, people who seem overly concerned about making sure that their partner is happy. And you know what I mean. Like, we are both obviously concerned that our partners are happy because we love them and we always want them to be happy. So that's like daily. But people who seem excessive in that regard, I suppose. Scared of doing something wrong, maybe. Yes, yes. I think that would be a better way of describing it uncharacteristically skipping work or school or social events or get-togethers with friends for no reason. Also wearing clothing that doesn't really work with the season. And again, it helps if you know people. So like I tend to wear long sleeves all the time because I'm on sun-sensitive meds. But if you know someone who usually wears tank tops and t-shirts in warm weather and suddenly they're wearing long sleeve shirts all the time, maybe think why. And then of course in children... And again, it depends so much on the child, doesn't it? Because, you know, knowledge of adult issues that would be inappropriate for their age, children who run away from home or go missing from home for periods of time. I mean, if they, for example, I don't know, if you're a kindergarten teacher or a teacher and you have the feeling the kid is scared when the parents is around. Yeah, exactly. And it is recommended that if you do try to talk to somebody about your concerns, you know, ask them if anything is wrong, talk specifically about what's concerning you, make sure you listen to what they're telling you, offer to help, even if all the help that they want from you is knowing that you're there to talk and that you're keeping things between, you know, just the two of you. And if the victim is a minor, you should always talk to other people that you can trust and get a specialist involved if you suspect abuse in a minor. And some places where you can get advice on your next steps in the United States, you can visit childhelp.org, which has phone numbers that you can call or also numbers that you can text to report suspected child abuse or neglect. I actually had to do this once. I called the no emergency police line because I was in college and at the time, there wasn't, you know, you didn't have the option to text people or hotlines. But we had a neighbor that would scream at her kids. And it wasn't the screaming. I had an Irish mother who, you know, said on more than one occasion, I'm not yelling, I just have a loud voice, <laughs> you know, so like screaming moms, that's fine, whatever, that that's normal to me. But it was what she was yelling at the kids. It was the words she was saying that were really just inappropriate for anyone. So I ended up calling and I I don't know what happens. They don't, you know, I tried to follow up and didn't get any info. I hope that worked out all right. And we also want to add that there are so many cases where for a variety of reasons, an adult or a child that you may know could have suffered serious abuse and mm. you just didn't see it and no one is blaming you. We want to be really crystal clear about that. You don't need us to tell you how often abuse comes to light and even the closest people are shocked, people who were paying attention. And I think it's also something we don't want to see, right? So not only do abusers and their victims learn to hide the truth, but we when you don't want to see what the truth is, it makes it even easier to hide, right? Yep. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. All right. So now we're just going to get back into the absolutely devastating story of what happened to Sylvia. So I think I'm going to give you a quick recap uh, of what we talked about so far last week. So, you know, a little reminder. So 16-year-old Sylvia Likens and her 15-year-old sister move into the house of Gertrude Beniszewski. She's age 37 and her seven children, they are age 17 until one. <laughs> so they're, hmm. a, a, yeah, a kid at every age. Mrs. Beniszewski had promised Lester and Betty Likens, who are Sylvia's parents, that she would take care of the two daughters, quote, as if they were my own, end quote. Of course, not because of the goodness of her heart, but because the Likens would pay Gertrude Beniszewski $20 a week. The neighborhood kids like to hang out in the Beniszewski house. The regulars are 15-year-old Coy Hubbard, who is Stephanie Beniszewski's boyfriend, and 14-year-old Ricky Hobbs, who lives around the corner and considers himself to be a friend of Gertrude, not a friend of the kids his age. When one of the payments is a couple of days late, Gertrude beats the Likens girls for the first time with a police belt that was left behind by her first husband, uh, who's actually also her third husband. Over time, the attacks, which pretty much only focus on Sylvia, they get more and more violent, and it doesn't only include physical torment, but also emotional and mental abuse. 
for example, Silvia is not allowed to use shampoo or detergent. She's not allowed to sit at the table and to eat with the rest of the family. She's actually not allowed to eat enough food most of the time anyway. And of course, she's also beaten. At one point, Gertrude's oldest daughter, Paula, joins in and punches Silvia several times. So I think that's that's pretty much how far we came last week. And this week we will be talking more about the torture and abuse. Uh, so it's going to be a little bit more detailed. We said already in part one that the biggest and best source for this was the trial transcript, Banishevsky versus the state of Indiana. But of course, there are other sources as well, uh, some contemporary newspaper articles, radio interviews, and the book House of Evil, the Indiana Torture Slaying by John Dean. It was a little bit hard researching this because there's just not a good way to put all the abuse in exact chronological order. Because, you know, in, during the trial, it was like, well, this happened and this happened and this happened. But yeah, I think it's not really necessary to know what what went on at what time exactly, except for the last two weeks. And this isn't a huge time period. No, that escalated really quickly. Yeah, yeah. It was beginning to mid-August when Paula punched Sylvia so hard that she actually broke her own wrist, resulting in Paula needing to wear a cast for six to seven weeks. By the way, this cast didn't stop her from hitting Sylvia. She now actually used it as another mean to, to punch Sylvia in the face with it. And it's not as if Paula would have felt remorse about that. She even admitted it openly to other Sunday school attendees that she was hitting Sylvia often. And nobody there took it serious enough. It's just amazing to me that she would say that on, at Sunday school of all places. It's different times and children would get beatings, but yeah, not punching still. them until my wrist is broken. Yeah, and by another kid. At that yeah. time, you, your parents might give you a, a whipping or a belting yeah. or a switching, or but I don't think it would be commonplace to have your sibling dole out the punishment. That seems very strange, I think, at any time. So she talked about it openly and, and nobody, yeah, nobody seemed yeah. to care a lot. But at least it caused the young priest from the church they visited to go over to the Beniszewski home one afternoon and to talk to Gertrude about Paula hitting Sylvia. So they are sitting in the living room and she's offering him coffee, I guess, or tea. And Gertrude tells the priest that Sylvia was running wild, causing nothing but trouble. She's sleeping with older men, she's telling lies, she's stealing. And that Gertrude had tried to discipline the young girl, but she, because she was very sickly, you know, she had asthma. We talked about that already. She was so weak that she needed Paula to help her to discipline the children or to discipline Sylvia by punching her. Jenny was there with them in the room and Gertrude got her to confirm all the horrible things she had said about Sylvia. The priest was sitting there, he had no real advice, but he just sat there and prayed with Gertrude, which is, yeah. Mm. So Sylvia would be beaten with a paddle, which was a quarter inch thick, you know, this kind of uh, fraternity style paddles, mm -hmm. or the police belt regularly. They would burn her with cigarettes and matches. Coy Hubbard and some other kids would practice judo flips on her. They were throwing her around in the kitchen. And there were so many excuses made to punish Sylvia. The whole family came up with several allegations against the 16-year-old. Uh, for example, Gertrude said that Sylvia had called her a rude word. Uh, she was accused of stealing $10 from Gertrude's purse. She was accused of stealing from the drugstore. She was punished for collecting bottles at the park. Uh, she was punished for eating candy one time. And another time... Her breath allegedly smelled like hamburger and she had kind of an imaginary mustard stain around her mouth that only Gertrude could see apparently. They made her eat a hot dog loaded with all kinds of condiments and it must have tasted really horrible because Sylvia threw up. That didn't stop Gertrude and their kids. They tried to make Sylvia eat everything that she had just regurgitated. Yeah, no, that's... This is that that's almost the worst part for me, but I'm a metaphobic, so it's one of the worst. It's it's very yeah. It's yeah. The food situation in the house must have been pretty bad. There was just never enough food there. If there was milk, it was reserved for the baby. The kids would eat soup and crackers or toast and, and butter or margarine. These kids are growing. You know how it is. Yeah. Kids need a lot of food. I can understand why there would be a lot of snitching and jealousy about food related issues, right? Yeah, it's the whole situation, it's its very sort of Lord of the Flies, but also with a grown-ass adult as the ringleader. Yeah. So it's just this level of torture and depravity is so hard to wrap our heads around. And it should be hard to talk about and hard to hear, you know, but it's, it's just awful. And it's not going to get any better. 
So there was an incident where, on one occasion, Jenny had found a tennis shoe while she was at a park taking a walk with her sister. And it was a single shoe, but she testified at the trial that because she wore a leg brace on her left leg, she didn't need two matching shoes. So, of course, she tried on the tennis shoe, and it fit okay, and so Jenny wore it home. Which, we talked about this earlier, but... How sad is that, that you would trade... It's these little details, right, that are like... Yeah, yeah, that really... Because to just find a shoe in the park and be... You know, it just makes me want to cry. Once they get home, Gertrude freaks out. She accuses Jenny and Sylvia of stealing the shoe. Like, where the fuck are you going to steal a single shoe from? I guess if you went to a shoe store where Mm. they just have the single... But, I mean, it must have been a worn-out shoe. I don't think the shoe was new. Exactly. It wasn't a brand new shoe. It's just any excuse, really, is all yeah. she needed. Any excuse to accuse Jenny and Sylvia of stealing, and she beat them both with the paddle. So, August has now come and gone. It was September, and all the kids were back at school. Sylvia was enrolled at Arsenal Tech, and so were Stephanie and Paula Banishevsky. But 17-year-old Paula was enrolled in the evening division, as she had to work day shifts at a local drugstore to help earn money and help pay the bills. Now, last week, we briefly mentioned Paula Banishevsky's alleged pregnancy. Well, It's not alleged. She was indeed pregnant, and the father of the baby was an older married man, but nobody knew for sure who he was. Paula had told Sylvia and Jenny sometime during the summer, but we don't think the girls took it seriously back then. It might have been a joke, but Mm. now, as the months passed, you know, Paula clearly was starting to show, and we think Gertrude suspected that She was pregnant, but just didn't want to see it. And so Sylvia was accused of having sexual relationships and of being pregnant instead. It's it's like she was a scapegoat, right? Yeah, deflecting 101. So I think it was... Just one of the only times, right, that Sylvia ever tried to retaliate because apparently she did start a rumor at school about Paula and Stephanie Banishevsky saying that they were easy and would give out sexual favors in exchange for money or gifts. And don't forget that this was 1965. And I mean, those are those are shocking allegations today for for high school age children. But this was 1965. Mm. And this was just, you know. So maybe Sylvia didn't even, you know, take it that far and just hinted at the possibility and the rest was added, like, telephone game style, whisper down the lane style, uh, you know, how high school rumors are. Whatever Sylvia said or not, word spread. And so a boy ended up confronting Stephanie one day, asking her how much she wanted. So Stephanie asked him where he had heard such nonsense from, and he said, from a friend of yours named Sylvia. So, of course, Stephanie rushes home and confronts Sylvia, and apparently Sylvia admits to having said some things about her. And so Stephanie punched Sylvia, but she actually did start crying because she thought that Sylvia was her friend. This whole situation is, I don't know. Kind of petty, typical teenager thing, except for the punching, but you know what I mean? It's like... Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's just we have you have to throw the physical violence in there, and I mean there was punching in school. I can remember there being fights in school, but it's all part of the bigger thing. They ended up making peace about it, but then when Coy Hubbard heard the rumors that Sylvia had allegedly spread about his girlfriend, he punched her, and then again with these judo flips, he just flipped her over his shoulder. He never forgot about the lie that Sylvia told in school, and he held a grudge against her from that day on. And Gertrude, of course, beat Sylvia with the paddle when she heard about the incident. Another thing that Gertrude really liked to do was cause fights between Sylvia and the Beniszewski kids and also the neighborhood kids. So she told them things like, well, did you hear Sylvia said your mother pleasures men for a couple of dollars? Or did you know that Sylvia called you a slut behind your back? You know, it's similar wild lies. And then, of course, the children believed her. She was a grown-up, you know? Yeah. And they would punch her and kick her. And, yeah, one time a girl kicked Sylvia in the abdomen. And there are sources that state that she was lying on the floor holding her belly and crying, Oh, my baby. I don't know what that means. Like, did Gertrude really manage to convince Sylvia that she was indeed pregnant? I think it's possible. I think that the woman who was supposed to be caring for the Ligons girls... Gertrude was so pathologically sadistic Mm. that 
it's possible. And it's also possible that Sylvia didn't exactly know how things were. Yeah. And thought she might have thought she was pregnant. I mean, we've seen that yeah, yeah. time yeah. and again as well, right? It's not like it's not like there was a big movement to talk about the birds and the bees in the sixties. I can see how Gertrude managed to get all the kids really riled up against Sylvia. And then the kids and Gertrude, they get used to kicking and scratching and slapping and choking Sylvia. They would throw Coke bottles and cans at her, hitting her in the head or in the in the hand. They fist punched her in the face until she had a black eye. Sometimes they even forced Jenny to slap her sister. And one time during one of the incidents when the neighborhood kids tortured Sylvia, you know, slapping and kicking her and they were ripping her blouse off of her. Uh, Ricky Hobbs, you know, the neighborhood boy who lived around the corner, he walked into the house and he saw what's going on and he was like, oh, everybody's having fun with Sylvia. It was not only the neighborhood kids who saw what was going on in the house. On at least one occasion, a grown-up witnessed Sylvia's abuse and they also saw Sylvia eating out of a trash can and they failed to report all of this. Yeah, yeah. And I think this is part of, I think this this aspect of the story, like all these adults and all these children who are all involved in this abuse, and it reminds me a little bit of like a very long, prolonged version of the Kitty Genovese story where, you know, she was the she was the victim in New York who was attacked and was screaming for help and all these people in windows looking down did nothing. Yeah, but I mean, that was debunked actually. I know it was. I w- it was. Yeah, people did do things. But you know what I'm saying? I mean, so many people knew what was happening to Sylvia. So many people knew. And they had to, even the other kids, right? Yeah. And then, of course, now you're going to talk about, I think we're talking about Mrs. Vermillion and that incident. For example, yeah. Yeah. So the story with Mrs. Vermillion, she, she and her husband and her two kids, they had just moved into the house behind the Beneshevsky houses. And remember, we told you the, the houses were all really close to each other yeah really close and mrs vermilion heard all the noise and screaming going on over there and she felt in the beginning kind of sorry for gertrude you know she was this poor single mother taking care of nine children all by herself so one day gertrude invited her over for a cup of coffee and they are over there sitting in the living room having their coffee talking and gertrude tells mrs vermilion how hard it is to take care of so many children but uh hey she can take care of her two kids during the day when mrs vermilion is at work i mean can you actually imagine that woman offering you to babysit for you in this situation so mrs vermilion is like um I don't know. And she looks around the room and she sees Paula, Stephanie and Sylvia. And Sylvia clearly has a black eye. And so Mrs. Vermillion asks her, how did you get that black eye? And Sylvia just turns away. She doesn't answer. And Gertrude starts screeching at Sylvia. Get out of my sight. I hate you. And Paula pulls Sylvia back into the kitchen and throws a cup of burning hot water at Sylvia's face. Sylvia screams and then Paula gets the margarine and rubs it on the burn spots. Mrs. Vermillion is sitting there watching all of this. She ended up not letting Gertrude Beneshevsky babysit her children, but they stayed in friendly contact with her and she never reported any of these things. Yeah. And it's especially upsetting because there's just, there's like, like I was just saying, there's no way people in that neighborhood didn't know what was going on. And there was just such a sense of, I think there just used to be such a sense of mind your business. It's not your business, you know, just keep yourself to yourself. And thank God that's changed in some places. But there were several occasions where the Banaszewski kids tried to get Sylvia to leave. So one time in mid-September, Paula took Sylvia out the back door and told her to leave for her own good. But Sylvia didn't leave, of course, because in her mind, there was no other place that she was going to go. Where would she go? Another thing that we told you about last week was that Sylvia's parents used to visit the girls whenever they were in Indianapolis. So from July to October, that was eight to ten times, roughly. On October 5th, Fifth, Lester and Betty Likens visited the house again, and they brought over some school clothes and left two dollars for Sylvia so that she could go and buy herself some new shoes. And they took the girls out for a coke. When they left, they had absolutely no clue of what was happening in the Banishevsky house, and they had absolutely no idea that they would never see Sylvia alive again. Well, Gertrude, of course, also kept the two dollars for the shoes. Oh God, yeah, of course she did. The next day, the 6th of October, was the last time that Sylvia Likens would attend Arsenal Tech High School. It all started because of a gym suit. In order to attend gym class, Sylvia needed a gym suit. But of course, there was no money for it. So one day, she returned from school with a gym suit. 
And how did she get her hands on this much-needed piece of clothing? Well, Gertrude knew it immediately that clearly Sylvia must have stolen it in school. So she whipped Sylvia with the police belt, yelling at her to admit it, and screaming things like, I hate you, at her. Stephanie tried to stop the whole ordeal, but Gertrude kept hitting Sylvia until she finally said, all right, I did it. So Gertrude then told Coy Hubbard to hold Sylvia while she held a lit matchstick to her fingers. I just can't with this woman and her Old Testament punishments. Mm. It's just, mm. she's, she's the worst. So after she was done burning Sylvia's fingers, she told the two Likens girls, quote, you are ruining my life. Go pack your things. You're going to the juvenile center tomorrow, end quote. And the girls got really excited, actually, thinking they were finally going to get out of there. How sad is that to get excited about the possibility to go uh, yeah. into juvie? Yeah. That's, it, this whole situation, it just makes me want to cry. They run upstairs, they pack all their stuff, they bring it downstairs, and then they're just waiting impatiently, desperate for the next day to arrive. But when the next day comes, they don't get to go to juvie, which again, how fucked is that? Like, they didn't get to go to juvie. And Gertrude just told them to get their stuff back upstairs. Sylvia was not allowed to go to school anymore. The kids were told to lie about it and say that Sylvia was now in juvie. At first, letters from Arsenal Tech came asking about the whereabouts of Sylvia, but after a while, Sylvia is at juvie or Sylvia skipped school and ran off with boys was enough of an explanation for the letters to stop coming. And soon after, that was around 12th of October, Sylvia was pushed down the stairs to the basement and she had to sleep down there from now on, on rags on the concrete floor. And she shared the basement with a puppy because, of course, these mm. assholes kept the puppy down there. I'm glad they had each other, though. Yeah, at least. The reason why Sylvia had to sleep in the basement from now on was that they didn't allow her to wash herself to keep herself clean. So they said she was filthy and that she couldn't keep herself clean and that she wet the bed. In the basement, she would only eat some crackers and a bowl of soup now and then, but she was told to eat the soup with her fingers. One time they even forced her to eat the content of one of baby Dennis' dirty diapers and they also made her drink mm. urine. It's unbelievable. And then the baths. They would start to give Sylvia a bath, which meant they would tie her up and lift her in the tub that was filled with scalding hot water. And Sylvia, of course, would scream, then faint. And they would revive uh, her by smashing her head against the bathtub. They would also rub salt or rubbing alcohol on her wounds, or they would pour dish soap powder on her. Paula also cut off Sylvia's hair at one point. On 15th of October, a visitor came to the house, a, a woman who introduced herself as a public health nurse, and the authorities had received an anonymous call from one of the neighbors that there was a girl at the Baniszewski house who was covered in sores, and Gertrude was shocked. The nurse could take a look at all of her children. They were all clean and healthy. There was not one sore to be found anywhere. Oh, you must mean Sylvia. Yeah, that girl is nothing but trouble. I kicked her out. Because she was sleeping around and never took proper care of herself, I have no idea where she is. So the nurse left and never came back, and Gertrude and Paula actually started to worry that, you know, that they were going to be found out one day, so they needed to come up with some evidence of Sylvia acting out and running away. And their solution was, and I'm sure they thought they are so clever, they made Sylvia write a letter. You want to read it, Annie? Yeah. Okay, so here's the letter. Dear Mom and Dad, I am writing to tell you what I've been done for the last two weeks. I went to school and took a gym suit out of the girls' gym locker. I went to the park and was going to take some Cokes out of a Coke machine. I let Ronnie and Donnie Simpson have intercourse, spelled wrong, with me. Danny and Jenny knows about it. In California, I was under the covers with Mike Eason. Jenny and Benny seen Mike's pants down. I was trying to get Jenny in trouble with me. I told lies on Mommy to Grandma Martin. I hit a three-year-old kid in the face and spanked it on the butt at the house on Post Road. I stole things in California when we lived out there. The reason why I got fired from that job in Post Road is because I hit the boy in the face. I'd done things that could cause a lot of trouble. I always want Mommy and Daddy to break up so I could get my way when I live with Mommy. I went out with a married man driving around in a convertible. I took $10 from Gertie Wright. I knocked Jimmy B. off my back. I hit Shirley B. for no reason. Jenny has been behaving herself. Sylvia Likens. End quote. I don't even know where to start with how outrageous and just 
bizarre this is. I think it would have been pretty obvious for Silvia's parents that this letter was just written by Silvia, but that it's not her own words, right? Yeah, it's got it. Yeah. So on 22nd of October, Silvia was once more allowed to sleep on the mattress upstairs. And this is so... I don't know what's... How do you come up with these ideas? They tied her to the bed and then they told her that she has to learn not to pee the bed. So we tie you to the bed and you can't go to the bathroom until you learn that you're not going to pee the bed. And of course she did pee the bed because she was tied to it. Of course, yeah. It's... This whole thing, it's awful. It's gonna get worse. On Saturday, 23rd of October, 1965... So there's an aspect of what Sylvia went through that we don't want to be too specific with, but I didn't know. I've heard other podcasts where it wasn't mentioned at all, and then suddenly certain references and memes I'd seen, I was like, oh, okay, I wish I'd known about this before. So let's just say it was the second time that Sylvia was humiliated in a sexually degrading way, assaulted with a soda bottle in front of everybody which is just Mm. unbelievably sad. That same day, Ricky Hobbs stopped by the house and Gertrude told the kids to get Sylvia from the basement. Gertrude then took a sewing needle, heated it up, and said that she was now going to brand Sylvia. She wanted to put, quote, I'm a prostitute and proud of it, end quote, on Sylvia's stomach. Gertrude scratched the eye, but she stopped after that because she felt sick and weak. So she told Ricky that he would have to do it. So Ricky, who was always eager to help Gertrude, we think maybe Gertrude had sort of brainwashed in different ways, Ricky. She groomed him, maybe. She Yes, I would say grooming is exactly the right yeah. word. Yep. And so Ricky had Marie heat up the needle, but before he could even start carving, he said, wait, how do you spell prostitute? And so Gertrude wrote it out for him on a piece of paper. After he was done with tattooing Sylvia, which is really, it's more of a brand than a tattoo, isn't it? They took her back to the basement. And then Shirley, one of the younger kids, and Ricky, they found uh, an anchor bolt, which they heated up, and they used it to brand Sylvia. Ricky wanted to draw an S on Sylvia, but Shirley messed up her half, and so they ended up branding a three onto her. Ricky kept hitting Sylvia in the chest, and every time she moved, he would tell her to hold still, and when he was done beating her, he went home. Sylvia was lying on the basement floor at this point, whispering to her sister Jenny that she was going to die, and she could just feel it. Jenny was still convinced that Gertrude would not allow this to happen, right? She just thought she's an adult. She has to take care, at least to make sure that nobody Mm. dies in her care, right? Mm. But the next day, Gertrude and Paula give Sylvia a bath. This time, it's more of a normal temperature bath, and they clean her up. And then they dictated to her yet another letter, which reads as follows, quote, To Mr. and Mrs. Likens, I went with a gang of boys in the middle of the night, and they said that they would pay me if I would give them something, so I got in the car, and they all got what they wanted, and when they got finished, they beat me up and left sores on my face and all over my body, and they also put on my stomach, I am a prostitute and proud of it. I have done just about everything that I could do just to make Gertie mad, and cause Gertie's more money than she's got. I've tore up a new mattress and peed on it. I have also cost Gertie doctor bills that she really can't pay and made Gertie a nervous wreck and all of her kids. And then it sort of trails off with end quotes. The next thing that happened was Sylvia started to refuse to eat the crackers they offered her and she told them to give them to the puppy instead, which is just, Jesus, this whole story. <sighs> I think yeah. they all... They must have felt that Sylvia was about to die, or at least they soon would get into a lot of trouble because they had to get her to the hospital or have, you know, call an ambulance for her. So they probably tried to cover their asses with, you know, cleaning her up, having her write that letter. Of course. Gertrude even talked about getting rid of Sylvia somewhere in a forest, which is expected by a person like Mm -hmm. her. Yep. It's Sunday, 24th of October, 1965. Sylvia complains that she can't swallow and is hit several times with a metal rod. Gertrude also tries to hit her on the head with the paddle, but misses Sylvia and instead hits herself, which causes a black eye. 
It is okay. Good. Koi Hubbard comes over and hits Sylvia several times on the head with a broomstick. They take the unconscious Sylvia back to the basement. And later, after she came to again, Sylvia complained that she can't see anything. Around midnight, Mr. and Mrs. Vermillion return home and they hear strange and very loud scraping noises coming from the Benishevsky house. And the noise continues and Mrs. Vermillion, she gets super annoyed and she goes outside to investigate. And then she sees light in the basement and realizes that's where the noise was coming from. And then the noise finally stopped. It was around 3 a.m. And nobody knows for sure what happened that night in the basement because... Gertrude would never talk about it, but I think it's quite possible that Gertrude tried to dig a hole down there. Oh yeah, absolutely. I wouldn't be surprised. I don't think Sylvia would have had the strength to make loud scraping noises alone down there. No, mm. I agree. I agree. And I think that if Gertrude had been able to successfully bury the body or hide the body and just say, oh, she ran off, she mm. that she might have gotten away with everything, really. Maybe, yeah. So the next day on 25th of October, Jenny and Gertrude try to feed Sylvia and get her to drink some milk, but she can't swallow at all. Uh, she tries to talk, but she was too weak. At times she would try to recite the alphabet, but couldn't get past D. She pointed at Gertrude, for example, and said, you're Gertie. And then she said, all my teeth feel loose. Gertrude Benishevsky was still trying to convince everybody in the house that Sylvia was fine, that she's just faking it. But Sylvia was not fine. She was not faking it. Sylvia was dying. She had a bowel movement again, so they poured detergent over her and they washed her down with a hose. Silver's breathing was flat and she was cold to the touch. So Ricky and Stephanie, they carried her upstairs for a warm bath and on the way Ricky dropped her and her head banged against the stairs. After the bath, they put her in a blouse and kind of caprice and they laid her on the mattress, half recovering her with, I don't know, it was either a blanket or a towel. And Gertrude was still screeching, she's faking it, she's faking it. And Ricky takes Gertrude downstairs. And in the meantime, Sylvia has stopped breathing. Ricky, who had come up again, uh, tried to give her CPR, breathing into her mouth. And then he ran downstairs and across the street to the payphone to call the police because Sylvia was dead. It's so strange to me that he ended up calling the police. I think, but again, I mean, they're, they're children. They, they, he was they 40. Are. They are children. They really thought yeah. they were doing what they were supposed to do because an adult told them to. I mean, they are not normal children. Don't get me wrong. But I really think, like Jenny mm. said in the trial, sh she was sure that Gertie wouldn't allow that to happen. You can't let a kid just die. And yeah. Yeah, of course. When the police arrived at the scene, they were told by Gertrude that Sylvia had been missing for two weeks and that she'd just come back home that day, bruises all over her with a carving on her stomach, and that she had this letter with her. And with that, she hands the police the Dear Mr. and Mrs. Likens letter, which I still don't know why it wouldn't have said Dear Mom and Dad or Dear Mother and Father. Do you know what I mean? And Sylvia just... tried to write Dear Mom and Dad, and she said, no, Dear Mr. and Mrs. Likens. Like, yeah. What? Why? It's, yeah. It's... So, in the meantime, Paula had come home, and when she was told Sylvia had died, all she said was, you're kidding me. Then she started to read from the Bible, telling Jenny, who was of course crying, that it was God's will and that she should stay with them, and they would treat her like a sister. And all Jenny could say was, get me out of here and I will tell you everything, to the closest police officer. And she did. Gertrude, her children, Coy Hubbard, and Ricky Hobbs, they were all arrested. I wish we could play you an audio clip right here, but I, honestly, I worry about copyright claims. In 1965 and 1966, WIBC, that's Indianapolis-based radio station, they extensively covered the case and the trial. And they also interviewed, for example, Ricky Hobbs and Gertrude Beniszewski. We will put the link in our sources on Facebook so you can listen to it. Or if you're not in the Facebook group, just search for WIBC Sylvia Likens on YouTube and you should easily find it. It's, it's very interesting. It's very disturbing. Okay, speaking of disturbing... <sighs> We're going to talk briefly about Sylvia's autopsy. So this is bad. The autopsy showed over 150 different wounds. There were almost 100 cigarette burns alone. Her genitals were severely swollen from the kicking. Her kidneys were injured, probably a result of all the judo flips, and most likely the cause for her bedwetting. Also, abuse will make you at your bed. That can, yeah. that can be a sign but of that, abuse, that, obviously. But there was a physical... You know, there was a physical reason yeah. for her to wet the bed and they punish her for something they did to her. It's just... Of course. It's awful. It's... There were burns, especially on her face. There were bruising, extensive muscle and nerve damage. 
She had bitten her own lips, and a very sad detail is the only part of her lip that had no deep tearing in it was where her one tooth was missing. Her nails were broken backwards. There were just so many injuries. So many injuries. It was like layer upon layer upon layer of injuries, right? Because some had started to heal. Others had, you know, almost completely healed. Like you could see that there was, this had been happening for a long time. The ultimate cause of death was determined to be a subdural hematoma caused by a severe blow to the right temple. And contributing factors were, of course, malnourishment and shock from all the other injuries that had weakened Sylvia contributing to her death. When Lester and Betty Likens received the phone call informing them of their daughter's death, they jumped on the next possible flight from Florida to Indiana. Sylvia Marie Likens was buried on the 29th of October, 1965, in Lebanon, Indiana, and her headstone reads, quote, Our darling daughter. So sad. The trial against Gertrude Benishevsky and her two children, Paula and John Stephan Jr., as well as Coy Hubbard and Ricky Hobb, starts on 18th of April 1966, and it will last 17 days. If you read through the trial transcripts, the defense tried really hard to come for Jenny Likens, you know, asking her why she hadn't helped her sister, why she hadn't had asked for help from anyone in the neighborhood, which I get it. It's something a defense would do, but it's such a horrible approach. It's so inhumane to do that to a kid who just went through this right oh victim blaming a child yeah (laughs) yeah but i have to say jenny really held herself together really well in court she really did amazingly i'm sure jenny and every member of the lycans family must have felt so much remorse and survivor's guilt and then to be questioned over and over again why why didn't you help her why why you slept her why (laughs) it's unimaginable Gertrude, of course, claimed to be innocent. She stated that she had been sick in in bed most of the time and that she had to take medication and that she was sleeping and that the kids had been doing whatever they wanted. She doesn't know what the kids had been up to. But all the kids, even her own kids, testified against her. She was... She was awful. And also, can we just take a quick moment and just let you know, the listener, in case you haven't seen the photos of Gertrude, am I wrong that she legitimately looks like she was drawn as a Disney villain? Uh, Absolutely. Spot on. Yeah. Like the first time I saw a photograph of her, I literally thought, seriously, sincerely thought, I think it was from the trial, like one of her mugshot photos, I thought I was looking at a Disney sketch of like a cross between Cruella DeVille's face with none of her style, and then Lady Tremaine from Cinderella, her her hair, but none of the elegance. She's the fucking worst, and she looks like it. She's just, ooh, she looks like a Disney villain. There are these cases where somebody does horrible things, and you're like, oh, he looks like such a nice person, or so pleasant, or friendly. Yeah, you'd never know. But she doesn't. She's like, she looks evil. Yeah. Like, I don't even know. You you described her perfectly. Absolute Disney villain, yeah. Perfect. Sincerely evil. Yeah, it's like a caricature. It's like she couldn't even be real. She looks so evil. You just look at her and think evil. So all of her kids and all the witnesses, they all painted a pretty clear picture of what had happened in the Benishevsky house over the month. For me personally, one of the saddest moments during the trial was the testimony of Jennifer Likens, especially one quote that well, that quote was even used in the movie An American Crime, starring Elliot Page, Catherine Keener, and James Franco. So they asked Jenny in court, did you ever see Sylvia cry? And she replies, quote, They said she did not have feelings, but I know better. I have seen her cry before, but I imagine the reason she did not cry was because she didn't have enough water. End quote. (sighs) So awful. On 19th of May 1966, the jury deliberates for eight hours. They found Gertrude Beniszewski guilty of first-degree murder, recommending a sentence of life imprisonment. Paula Beniszewski was found guilty of second-degree murder, and Ricky Hobbs, Coy Hubbard, and John Stephan Beniszewski Jr. were found guilty of manslaughter. Gertrude and her children did burst into tears. Hobbs and Hubbard, they stayed quiet when the sentencing was read out. On May 25th, Gertrude and Paula Beniszewski were formally sentenced to life imprisonment. The same day, Richard Hobbs, Coy Hubbard, and John Stephan Beniszewski Jr. each received sentences from two to 21 years to be served in the Indiana Reformatory. All three of them spent less than two years there and they were paroled in 1968. It's not enough time. Ricky Hobbs died of lung cancer in 1972 at age 21. 
Coy Hubbard never changed his name. He stayed in Indiana. He had several run-ins with the law throughout his life. And then after the movie An American Crime was released in 2007, Coy Hubbard was actually fired from his job. Uh, he died only a few months later at age 56 from a heart attack. John Stefan Benishevsky Jr. changed his name and became a lay minister, and he also counseled children of divorced parents. He died in 2005 at age 52. And as for the other Benishevsky children, the murder charges against Stephanie were dropped in exchange for her testimony in court, and she took on a new name, married, and became a teacher. It's just lovely to think she's now working with children, isn't mm -hmm. it? Mary Shirley and James moved in with her father, John Stefan Benishevsky Sr., and Dennis Wright Jr. was adopted. He died in 2012 at age 47. Paula gave birth to a baby girl. She named her Gertrude, which also is like... <laughs> Yeah. Who, who does that after this? I mean... And the girl was adopted and hopefully she has a loving family and a happy life. Seriously. I wish her I all really the best. I really hope she just knows nothing. Yeah. yeah. In 1971, Gertrude and Paula were granted a retrial and on that occasion, Paula pled guilty for voluntary manslaughter and this would earn her imprisonment from 2 to 20 years. The same year, Paula tried to escape not once but twice from prison but she was caught and it is very surprising that she was granted parole in 1972. Why? After her release, Paula was living under a new identity and started to work as a teacher's aide in Iowa. Uh, she had, of course, failed to mention her criminal past when she applied for the position and it took 14 years for her to be found out. In 2012, her true identity was discovered and she was fired immediately. As for Gertrude Benishevsky, she was once more found guilty of murder and sentenced to life in prison during the retrial. And over the next one and a half decades, she was acting as a model prisoner, of course they always are, working as a seamstress, and she was considered somewhat of a prison mom to the younger inmates, which is like, oh, I want to throw up. Yeah. Of course, she was displaying such a good behavior that she was granted parole in 1985, and she relocated to Iowa, where she lived under the name Nadine Van Fossen. Nadine being her middle name and Van Fossen, of course, her maiden name. It's so plain wrong. Yeah. She should have died in prison. She never took on the responsibility for Sylvia's death. The only positive thing is she was not free for a long time because in 1990 she died of lung cancer at age 61. And when Jenny Likens read the obituary, she cut it out and mailed it to her mom with the note... Quote, some good news, damn old Gertrude died, ha ha ha, I'm happy about that, end quote. <laughs> good for her. The Benishevsky house, it was boarded up and stayed empty for several decades. Now and then looky loose and others would get into the house. Some left horrible graffitis like, quote, I'm a prostitute, smeared in giant letters over one of the bedroom walls, which is like... Don't do that. Don't be that yeah. person, please. Uh, the house was demolished in 2009, and one of our Hellions actually told us that it is now a parking lot for the church across the street. And I think that's that's fine. I think this house must have had some really bad juju. Not enough sage in the world. No. And the Likens family, how did they go on after this absolutely horrendous crime? Jenny Likens later married. She had two children, and for the rest of her life, she was scared of Gertrude, which, of course, she would be. The woman was living a Disney nightmare. I can't even fathom what she went through. She died in 2004 at the age of 54 from a heart attack. What's absolutely heartbreaking is we read that she suffered the heart attack after somebody mistakenly rang her doorbell. She wasn't expecting anybody, and it was in pizza delivery who had the wrong address, but it ended up scaring her to death. Which is... Horrible. Awful. Lester and Betty Likens, they ended up getting divorced in 1967, which is not a surprise, right? This is something we see so often after, you know, even after the, the non-traumatic death yeah. of a child, like just losing a child, but especially in this case, such a traumatic and violent death of their child. I'm sure they both blamed themselves so much for leaving Sylvia and Jenny in the care of Gertrude Banaszewski. Betty remarried a while later. All her life, she kept a pink suitcase full of paper clippings from newspapers, letters, and baby pictures. She called it her suitcase of sorrow. Whew. She died in 1998. Lester Likens started to work in Las Vegas. We think he worked in the gaming industry. Later on, he moved in with his oldest daughter, Diane, in California, and he passed away in 2013. And 
As for Diane, she had to experience another tragic loss. She married again and worked as a school bus driver in California until she retired. In 2015, she and her husband wanted to visit one of their children in Palm Springs, and apparently they wanted to drive a shortcut, but they somehow got off track and ended up lost in the desert where their car broke down. They only had a little bit of water with them, some oranges, and a pie. They wouldn't be found for two weeks. And unfortunately, Diane's husband had died after the first week. I can't imagine. How do you get through this? All of this, that's too much for one life. It's just too much. It's too much. It's too much. And how do you, I'm always amazed with like how you go complete in this day and age, 2015. How do you go missing for that long with? They were searching for them immediately. Yeah, yeah, it's just, I can't even imagine what it would be like surviving that. I don't even like to think about what she went through with that one. Diane recovered, and we think she still lives in California, but that's something I don't think I'd want to survive. You know, it's so many things. It's too many things. It's so unbelievably sad. Not only, of course, mainly Silver's story, but her whole family, her whole family, It's too much for a family. And isn't it especially sad that most of them died really young and and Betty and Lester had a somewhat long life and had to live with that for such a long time afterwards? Yeah. It's so much for a family. It's a hard one to talk about. And you know, in my neck of the woods, there's always a lot of talk about the Kennedy curse, right? Like, how can so many shattering tragedies happen to one family? But it does. It happens all the time. It's just to families without any wealth or fame, you know? It's just so sad. This case is... It's unbelievably sad. It's so sad. And I really... I hope we could do that young, lovely girl some justice here. Her story, we cannot do her any justice, that we did her story justice, you know what I mean. Right, yes, exactly, exactly, yeah. All right, do we have something good? Do you have something good? Yes, I do. We definitely need something good. (laughs) I teased you already the last two weeks with it, now I think I can finally say it, right? I I think so, I think so. I think there's no more jinxing now. Uh, We are buying a house, well... When you're listening to this, we already bought the house because uh, we're going to sign the papers tomorrow. So we wanted to build a house, but I was always kind of iffy about it because it's a lot of work and so much stress. And so I always kept looking a little bit like, you know, with one eye in the ads. Oh, yeah. And then I saw a house and I was like, well, that looks interesting. And we checked it out and we loved it. And it I know it sounds weird, but there was even a sign from my dad, in my opinion. I'm going to tell you about it another time. It was definitely a sign. There were so many people who wanted to buy the house and we got it. And yeah, (laughs) papers are due tomorrow. So yes, we have a house. Don't say anything about the house in our Facebook group because my cousin is there and I want to surprise him. Yeah, he's going to come over on Thursday. Next week, we can talk about the house and I can show you photos and and everything. But please keep it, you know, quiet until next week. (laughs) Keep it zipped. Yeah, don't ruin the surprise. I'm really excited for you. Yay! I'm so excited for you. So excited. I'm so excited for you. Yeah, it's going to be awesome. How about you? So I was able to book a COVID vaccine for my dad. So that was a huge relief. So next week, he'll be coming up and uh, we'll take him to get his vaccine. He's 77 and on immunosuppressants. So I just feel like once my family is vaccinated, I'll finally like be able to unclench my jaw Mm. a little bit, you know, like just, okay. I also, on a cheerier non-COVID note, finally watched The Queen's Gambit, thought it was brilliant. And I also finally finished I'll Be Gone in the Dark, which obviously I started that ages ago and it's so beautifully done. But then I ended up stopping it in the middle for widow reasons. And then I just finally went back and watched the end and I just wanted to reach through the screen and hug Mm. Pat and Oswald. It was so good. I'm still behind on almost everything else. I have to watch that one. What else? Patreon. Uh, If you would like to join our Patreon community of supporters, you can go to patreon.com and search for Fresh Hell, or you can go to our website, uh, www.freshhellpodcast.com, which of course has links to everything. Right now we're organizing an online game of Cards Against Humanity with some of our Patreon 
patrons. So I'm really looking forward to that. I'm also sort of looking into doing trivia nights, which I think that could be fun. Yeah. What else? Reviews. If you have a couple of seconds, it's not even a minute, and you like our podcast, please do us a huge favor and big honor to go over to iTunes and leave us a review or a rating or both. We love to read your reviews and they're always really elaborate. You're really good at writing reviews. I have to say that. We have the best listeners. We really, we, we really do have the best listeners. <laughs> and if you want to meet new Hellions, go over to Facebook. Yes. Search Fresh Hell Podcast Murder. The murder part is important <laughs> because you might accidentally end up in, there is, I, I assume, a fantastic podcast called What Fresh Hell, which is about parenting. Yeah. So you want to search Fresh Hell Murder, and that will make sure you get to the right yes. place. That's important. I really always wonder if they're already like, no, you're, you're searching for the murder podcast. That's not the place you're looking yeah. for. We haven't had... Nobody's accidentally come into our group thinking we were the parent no, Not group. that we know of. Maybe they came and enjoyed it. <laughs> it's possible. It's just It's state. very possible. <laughs> it's a good... It's a nice space. It's fun people. It's good stuff. Tell your pets we said hi. Yes, all of them. Hug them. Treat them kindly. Always. Cuddle Always. them. Always. Give them an extra cookie from us. We love them. And uh, we love you. We miss you. We're looking forward to seeing you in person one of these days. And until that happens, if you're going through hell, keep going. Tschüss. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye.